So today we're going to answer that question of yes, you can do long exposure, deep sky astronomy and photography with an Altas mount. And the reason I've done this video is because I get really annoyed when I'm on the Facebook groups and on the astronomy groups and somebody says, oh, I've bought this wonderful um, Celestron 6SE, you know, cost me thousands of pounds. And somebody straight away goes, oh, it's rubbish. It's useless for, for DSOs. Put it in the bin, go and get something else. And that's completely not true. So I'm gonna show you in this video with help of Charlie the Cool Dude and Sophie the Kind Human, exactly what the problems are with alt as mounts, why you get issues and how you can overcome them. Thank you. Hi. So I've got Sophie the Kind Human and Charlie the Cool Dude who are gonna to explain to you how the rotation works of the sky. Yeah. So here we have this cool little planetarium that Charlie built, remember? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, are you going to find Cassiopeia for me? Right there, that little, that little W. Yeah, and that's why it's important, it's W shape. So, at the sky, now, it looks like a W. So, you're going to move it on a few hours by turning the disc, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Go on then. Don't you know how to do it? Okay, and now does it still look like a W shape? Um, it's kind of getting a little, like, it's kind of going a little bit down. Mm-hmm, I'll we'll do it a bit more. Okay, so what's happening to the W? It's the, it's... What number does it look like now? A three. Yeah, so that W has completely changed, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So as you can see, the issue with field rotation doesn't just happen with uh, you know large constellations with the W of Cassiopeia going like that, but it also happens on smaller objects as well. And so what happens is you get smearing if you try to do long exposures as your as your shape is changing as the, as the sky is moving around, you get smearing on images, which obviously means then you're not going to get um, good quality uh, astrophotography. And you can get around around with it so, with some stacking software, but it's not going to work. But there are ways that you can actually um, uh, you can actually get over this. So first of all, I thought I'd show you the difference between an Altaz mount and an EQ mount, so you can understand what the issues are. So what's the difference between an EQ mount and an Altaz mount? Well, I've got two here. I've got one mount and another mount, and I'll just quickly show you how they work. So an Altaz mount, which is, is a, a go-to an electronic version, but they all work the same way. It's quite simple and straightforward. This is how it sits and it goes left and right, up and down. So it moves around like that, left and right, and then this thing here, um, I'll loosen it off, it moves up and down in the sky. So it's very simple and very straightforward. So that is an alt as. And then an EQ mount looks slightly different. You have this section here, so that when you stand it up, you can see it's pointing in a certain direction. The idea with an EQ mount is that you point this section here towards the North Pole or the South Pole, depending on where you're using it. And then all you need to do to track an object is you track it in the RA axis, which is this thing here. So as, as the night sky goes around, this thing tracks it across the night sky. So the difference between the two from our point of view is that because this is tracking in the plane, if you like, in the circle of the sphere, the object always stays orientated correctly. Whereas with an alt as, it's just going up, down and left, right. Unless you're at the equator or at one of the poles, which I doubt anybody is, um, it means that there's always going to be that rotation because the sphere is moving in a completely different angle to just up, down, left and right. So you've seen what the problem is with the science. So how we get around it is that we can use, uh, we can plan our sessions because of the mathematics involved in um, alt, alt as calculations, i.e. calculating the effect of field rotations. There are sweet spots that we can aim for, which means we can do long exposures using alt as. So how do we find out what the field rotation is of uh, the object that we want to go and look for? So this is a really uh, helpful spreadsheet, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. 
And what this does is it enables you to put in a few values and it'll tell you straight away what your your sort of the, the field rotation is going to be. So first of all, you put in your latitude, so 55 degrees for me, and then you put in the, the alt and the as for the object that you want to look at at the particular moment in time that you want to observe it. So um, how you get those values is you use your um, whatever astronomy star chart software you use. So in this case, we have Stellarium. Um, so I put M16 in, you know, the pillars of creation, beautiful object. Uh, and it's telling me straight away that at sort of roughly one o'clock in the morning, it's going to be 181 degrees and 21 degrees. So we put that into our spreadsheet, 181 and 21. How long do we want to aim for? So I put eight seconds in. The um, sensor width and height, which you can get from the manufacturer of your camera or your um, astro cam. Uh, and then what it does at the bottom, it gives you a nice value for the sensor rotation. So that is the maximum amount of rotation that will be on the corners, if you like, of your observing area. Because we're dealing with circles, the middle doesn't rotate as much as the edges do. So uh, in this case, it's just over one pixel, which is, I would say, was absolutely fine. I don't have an issue with that at all. Um, and then what you can do, you can play around with different values. Uh, you know, you can increase the exposure or you can go for a different objects. So just to show you the sort of problems that you have, if you want something that's high in the sky um, in the north, so let's put zero in for the azimuth, which is due north. Uh, and then I'm gonna put 75 degrees in as my angle. Keep the exposures the same, obviously the imaging equipment the same. And as you can see, we're at nearly five pixels. So that would produce quite a, a smudgy, a smudgy image. So taking that one stage further, what I've done is I've taken all these values and created um, a couple of charts to look at this. So what you can do is you can sort of have a look at um, a sort of graph of these things. So uh, this is a field rotation chart for my um, for my sort of, you know, for my altitude at 55 degrees north, which is pretty, pretty typical for a, for a northern observer. So as you can see, what I've done is at the front are objects that are um you know they're, they're low in the sky and then at the top um it goes for goes higher and higher as you go further back and as you can see two things stick out so at 90 degrees which is this part here and 270 degrees which is this part there there is very little field rotation so that is east and west in in in, in english um the second thing that you can see is that the further up in the sky that you go, the more pronounced this field rotation is. So this arbitrary scale that I've got, you know, it goes up to 100, um, can show you the different things. So so the trick, um, as I say, is to look for, um, you know, east and west or low in the sky. You know, once you start going to the north or the south, then you start to have issues. So what happens if we're not at 55 degrees north? Well, the effects are more pronounced the lower you are, so the closer you are to the equator. So I did it for 30, which I'm just going to show you now. So this is for 30 degrees north. Um, and as you can see, it's exactly the same shape of graph, but it's 160 on our sort of arbitrary scale. So that means that we are, uh, you know, it's it's all more than one and a half times worse, if you like. Um, and then just to really exaggerate, I did it basically at the equator. I've done it at one degrees. So that's practically on the equator. And as you can see, we're now at 180. So there's nothing to stop you from doing long exposures close to the equator, but your margin for your sort of window of opportunity is smaller. So the, the thing about the east and west is even more important. Conversely, if you're close to either pole, so I've done 75 degrees here, as you can see, it's halved, so our maximum uh, rotation is 45 degrees, but the shape of the graph, therefore, the, 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 the rotation effects are exactly the same, um, no, no, no matter what. So how can we use this information? So uh, what I've also done, um, mainly because I'm a geek and no other reason for it, is I have taken all this information and I've put it into a chart. So I have a big database full of all the DSOs, all the deep sky objects. And what I, it's got all the information about magnitude and uh, uh, you know uh, RA and declension and stuff like that. So you can actually see um, you can actually see what uh, what what it is you want to um, observe. So I'm just going to move myself over here, and then I'm going to go to this chart. So this is the this is the chart that I use for, um, for 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 planning my observations. So it's got every every sort of DSO within a certain 
uh, range. And so it enables me to sort of look at what objects are going to be good in the sky. So, um, you know, without reading all these out, you'll spot a few things. So um, if I was going to go out tonight, which I'm not because it's chucking it down and thundering, so that's not going to happen. Um, my, 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 my targets that I would look at are things like M33, so that's the, the galaxy in Triangulum. There is the Cocoon Nebula and there is the Andromeda Galaxy M31. Because what I've also done, as well as taking the values from that spreadsheet, is that I've actually I've worked it out for my particular setup. So these are all, the sort of first 10 or 12 entries are all within one pixel. So there won't be an issue. And I've also worked this out for longer exposures than eight seconds, because eight seconds is a little bit, is a little bit skinny. Um, so you can see that sort of working from there. And then what I've also done is I've created a, a best observing chart. So the idea with this chart is I move myself back across here. Hello. Yes. So the idea with this chart is that um, it can give you an idea over a year, over a calendar year about when is going to be the best time to observe something. So if there's an object you really want to do, you've got an altar set up. It's going to show you good times and your bad times. So this is M31, this is the Andromeda Galaxy. And as you can see, it's pretty much okay throughout the year. But then when you get to sort of October, November time, there's a massive spike. And I'm going to assume that's because it gets south as it moves around the, the roofs around the sky. It must get sort of south and high as well. So we don't want um, we, we don't want to be planning our observations for that. And the irony is is that Andromeda is a an autumn constellation. You know, it's one of those constellations that we, we look for in the autumn skies. So you'd think that, well, this is the perfect time, but actually it's not. It's sort of, you know, as you see, we get a nice dip just at the beginning of September. And that's when, you know, if you were looking to do this, um, uh, you know, looking to plan your sessions, you would say, right, September is the time. So as you can see, it's practically zero in September. It, it doesn't rotate. Um, there are some caveats with this. It's specifically for my setup i think i've done it for midnight so obviously you know as you go through the uh as you go through your sort of observing cycles you may not always be out at midnight as it starts to get darker in the winter you may go out at nine o'clock ten o'clock so you can adjust those numbers there's no there's no problem but the, the the mathematics holds you know all it does is it shifts it across you know if you if you if you're observing earlier then it goes left and it goes right if you're observing later so it just gives you some sort of ideas the other thing is that things can fall off a cliff so obviously there's only some objects are only visible at certain times of the year so those objects um you know although they're low in the sky they may not be particularly easy for you guys to get so you've also got to take that in mind but it just goes to show that we can do um we can do long exposures uh, with with um, with a little bit of planning and uh, a little bit of mathematics. You've seen, in conclusion, if you plan your sessions, you can do long exposures with Alt the, the The exact exposure length depends on lots of factors, where the object is in the sky, what your setup is, so things like focal length, what you're using for observing, your camera's resolution, pixel size, uh, lots and lots of different apertures, you know, there's lots and lots of different um, things you have to take into account. But if you plan your sessions, you can do long exposures. Um, and if you can't be bothered with the science, and obviously there's a lot of funky spreadsheets knocking around, just do, is it in the east, is it in the west, or is it low in the sky? And if you follow those three rules, you'll be absolutely fine for 30 seconds up to about a minute. Anything after that, then fair enough, you would need to, you would need to plan your sessions. Oh, and also move to the North Pole. Thank you very much.